Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Marcel. Um, my name is Mark. Um, I'm a research associate here at the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, actually. And I have the pleasure to moderate this panel today here about how to build the future of financial markets. And I think um, we have um, yeah, a quite packed uh, panel here with uh, lots of expertise in financial markets and banking. Um, so we have here Sabi Wizard from Deutsche Bank, um, head of digital assets and currency transformation and focusing a lot of on tokenization, DeFi and so on. And he's also in, in, in the board of the Taurus uh, AG. And then you also have Prashant Malik um, from HSBC, um, technology and strategy partnerships lead, also focusing on uh, the digital assets topic. Uh, Jens Pausen from Deloitte, um, the director uh, for digital assets and tokenization, and yeah, leading the business in Central Europe on the digital assets topics. Um, Jürgen Hofbauer from Taurus, um, he's the head of global uh, strategic partnerships and yeah, working with partners across the digital assets ecosystem. And then last but not least, Javier Garcia Nonay from Intellect U EU. Um, he's the digital markets lead there. So um, we also had a preparation call actually and noticed that of course um, all are working on similar topics in the digital assets area, maybe from dis different perspectives, um, from consulting side, from banking side, um, or from technology provider side. But um, yeah, there are different domains defined, like uh, the custody service everybody is working on, asset tokenization in general, so the topic of tokenization is something we also want to discuss today, and then also digital money or cash on chain, including CBDCs and so on. And last but not least, blockchain is also um, yeah, enabling um, solutions for settlement, for better settlement of financial transaction, for collateral management, and improving a lot of efficiencies. And yeah, wh while the technology for digital assets is already there for several years, um, I would like to ask why is now the time to introduce digital assets? And has something in general changed? Maybe um, each of you could briefly mention wh why you think um, the situation has improved um, a lot in the, in the past. We start here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so I think maybe just to take half a step back from your question, the question is why, I would say, has it not succeeded up until now? And success is a relative thing, right? So success can be measured by the fact that we're all here and talking about it. That's clearly a measure of success. But has digital asset technology or blockchain displaced TradFi processes? The answer is no, right? And there's, I think, a lot of work to do. So your, you know, your question is, why is now a time? So I would say, thematically, there are a few big problems that were highlighted in the past that were barriers to the adoption of this technology. The first was regulatory, right? The fact that we lack regulatory clarity. Uh, not to say all problems are resolved, but we're much further along that regulatory journey than we ever were before. And we've got very proactive discussions, I would say, with most regulators in most, uh, most regions. We're very fortunate, obviously, as Deutsche Bank to be here in Europe, where I think there's a very progressive regulatory regime um, that we heard about uh, a bit earlier today as well. So that's one aspect. I think the second piece has been interoperability has been cited as one of the major stumbling blocks. Again, not to say all interoperability challenges are resolved, but the technology has moved on, which means there are actually options that try and address interoperability um, challenges. And the third piece I would say is actually, this is a huge ecosystem play. This is not just a play for banks. It requires fintechs to be there, it requires technology partners to be there, it requires regulators to be there, central banks to be involved, and the heartening thing is, all of those different players now actually at a much further stage than they were previously, and you can see that from some of the projects that get announced in the industry. So I, you know, I'm, I'm internal optimist, but I think I'm particularly optimistic at this point in time that some of those challenges that were big barriers before certainly have, have diminished in challenge compared to previously. Thanks. Uh, do you have something to add, Prashant? 
thanks, Mark. And uh, first of all, greetings, everyone. Uh, good to be back here. So um, have there been challenges with implementing digital assets? I, uh, definitely, yes. At industry level, surely, and also within an organization, you would also see challenges. But I think I would probably say that is this the right time to introduce? I would say this is the right time to further digital assets because some work has already been done, as Sabi also alluded to. Uh, with regards to industry challenges, you, of course, have regulatory uncertainty. Uh, you still have to work within sort of existing um, financial market infrastructures, uh, existing systems, so TradFi, DeFi, interoperability, as uh, also was mentioned before. Um, so there are, there, are, there are a few challenges, uh, uh, sort of, uh, quite a few challenges in industry as well. So you have, within the organization as well, you have challenges. My, my observation is that digital assets project actually, relatively speaking, take longer time to execute than TradFi projects. And uh, some of the reasons for that uh, basically are, you know, you have to do a lot of education, advocacy, uh, the technology itself, uh, you know, the release cadence uh, is, is a bit slower than some of the other traditional technologies. So, um, and, and often what we see is that, uh, you know, when you're building a, a new digital asset product, you, you're not just shifting uh, technology part uh, onto chain, uh, but you're also shifting risks and business processes on chain. So, uh, often we have to go back to the whiteboard and uh, really figure out what does it mean for the business. Um, and um, it's, it's actually a massive collaboration effort between technology, between compliance, uh, regulation, uh, operations. So the, 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 the pace at which you are churning these projects are also relatively slower. Um, if, you, if you look at the evolution of you know, how digital assets have progressed, traditionally it, ha it has always been uh, technology innovation pushing it, sort of uh, doing that innovation. And uh, more recently, I think uh, there's also increasing push, uh, pull from uh, the regulatory side and market side. So technology push has always been there. It's consistent, a great force, but now we also see increasing uh, force from the regulatory side. Uh, for example, you know, we did a bond issuance with um, uh, with Luxembourg, um, uh, Sterling bond issuance, uh, and we used uh, Lux regulatory regime there, which actually recognizes that if you do a DVP between a bond token and a money token, settlement token, that is legally recognized as a, as a title transfer. So that regulatory regime is basically supporting that. Regulatory regime is pulling uh, the uh, digital assets uh, into progressive uh, journey. Uh, and similarly, on the market side as well, we now see uh, traction and, you know, the exploratory work, for example, happening on the industry side. Um, you know, in the UK, you have uh, a security sandbox, uh, Euro system experiments looking into the interoperability. So those are very encouraging developments. Yeah, so this was the banking side. Something to add from consulting side, maybe, Jens? Well, I'm, I'm usually more on the on the positive side, um, because that's what I make my living of, um, setting the promise that there's something coming. But, but let me probably also take, take the other standpoint here and, 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 and address one of the biggest risks, and I think it's, it's fatigue. Because a, a lot of us in here have been, at least since the ERC20 standard came up, proclaiming that that's going to change everything. It's going to change the way we, we act with digital assets. It's going to, it's going to change the whole market infrastructure. And um, it took quite a while. As you said, you need to have technology on board. You need to have regulation on board. It, it's not like moving a small boat, but it's, it's really a big, big tanker that needs to, needs to be moved here. And uh, with all this repetitionally saying for years, it's going to come, it's going to come. We, we have this fatigue in the room. And, and also with the ones that are responsible for driving it, I realized they would much rather right now focus on DeFi and how to include that probably, but we haven't even solved the first step. So, so overcoming this fatigue and holding up the, the pace to really further advance on it and, and really finish the first steps and harvest what has been built. We've seen a lot of clients that have been building custody solutions, but haven't yet really started to even monetize on them or build more customer solutions on them. So we've started at the infrastructure layer, 
and we need to much more move into the product layer now um, and to address real client needs in order to build the products on the infrastructure that is available now. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, just maybe quickly to, to add a couple of points and not to duplicate what has been said before, uh, but also for the audience. So Taurus, for those who don't know us, we are an infrastructure provider for uh, digital assets and tokenization, um, working with uh, about 30, bank, 30 plus banks, um, six systemic banks. So we do have a good insight as to, to what's happening, um, at least across Europe as well. Um, I think technology, yes, has been there, has been uh, developing, um, but a big element is not just technology, but also people because at the end, it's people implementing, it's people working with it. Um, I think the last six years, we've come a long way as well um, in the ed educational process, uh, people understanding the technology and understanding the risks of it as well. Um, I know that uh, you know people also realize that you don't have to have the MPC solution uh, to make things work because it's the best and latest out there, but an HSM is okay because the business you're in, it works, and that's what you need for a business. So I think the realization is there. Um, changes I see um, in the interest rate environment, um, one of these, because again, business cases is kind of like, okay, how can we make that work? What's the money behind it? Um, but in high interest environments, it's also about um, the settlement processes. How efficient are you as a bank and how efficient are the settlement processes? And that's where we then come in on the stable coin side and so on, where we have seen quite a couple of projects kicking off. with. The now, again, you know, happy bull run on the crypto side. Um, and again, we're looking across the globe. So for some institutions, it's not the right thing because they can't touch crypto. Other jurisdictions allow it. We've seen um, crypto buy and hold and staking again coming up. Um, and that's, that's an easy one. Um, and so on. So, so really, it's, it's, it depends on what your institution is looking for, where you go. Uh, technology is there. People get more familiar with technology. Um, but again, yes, it's um, <laughs> I, li I like that actually, as, as you said, it's, uh, it's also the shift from innovation to business, because at the end, um, innovation is great, and, and I think people within innovation departments have a tough job, because they know what's out there, but they have to explain it internally, but they don't normally er uh, own a p and and that's where the money comes from, and that's kind of like the owners that have to say, okay, um, yes, we, we put the money behind it to actually adopt it. Um, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation. I guess that being the last one, I can only say that I have to agree on everyone because it's the uh, same topics everywhere. But uh, from our point of view, I will classify them into different buckets. First one is the education one, where, which is from a technology partner perspective, we need to make sure that our clients understand that moving into this world is not just a technological challenge, there are many things that come afterwards, like compliance, operations, P&Ls. There are many things that everything has to be within the same bucket. And the second one, um, I truly believe that we keep saying always the same words, right? Like liquidity, regulation, interoperability. So we normally tend to kind of like give real examples of what we have seen on the market. For example, regulation, we see a lot of conversations even today about Mika, right? About DLT pilot regime, right? But there are many other things that are happening on the market that are having a direct impact to what we're doing. Examples, uh, Basel Committee of on Banking Supervision are saying in the latest uh, consultation paper that permissionless networks should be treated as a group one in their capital assessment, meaning any asset where you're putting one euro, you need to just save another euro for capital treatment, right? That's a really important thing that institutions are looking into. DLT pilot regime, at the end of the day, is a sandbox, right? It's a sandbox to change something. CSDR, that's the regulation on settlement systems, right? So there are many things there that are happening that we really need, we really need to keep an eye on. US, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, they're moving into T plus one. What are we doing here in Europe? The UK said they're gonna be doing the same thing, right? So there are many things that are happening on the regulation aspect that are not just affecting crypto assets, but also tokenized securities. Um, on the liquidity side, we are, being, we are seeing a lot of projects, POCs, MVPs, going into real world scenarios where they're just testing primary markets, they're testing secondary markets, but the liquidity doesn't come with just issuing a security and trading it between investors. 
you need to mobilize them as well. You need collateral, you need repos, you need securities lending. So it's really, really important to go away from those islands from the, from the first slide and have a real market infrastructure that governs end to end. And on the third one, on interoperability, uh, I think there are many angles here. You could just tackle the technology aspect, which is how can I make sure that different protocols can be integrated together? How can I make sure that a blockchain network can be integrated with legacy systems? And there's another one, which is uh, how can I make sure that cash legs can be integrated with the asset legs? And that's all the topic that we've been discussing today with CBDCs, stable coins. But let's not forget, we already have fiat payment rails that can already tackle this topic. Yeah, thanks um, <clears throat> for all the insights to, to, to this topic. Um, I think um, there are still some steps to be made, but as I heard so far, um, a lot of obstacles have um, already overcome and hopefully um, it will get some faster traction in the upcoming years. Um, we also spoke a bit about the topic of tokenization, so I would like to speak um, to you about the topic of tokenization of real-world assets. Um, it's somehow, uh, it seems in the media sometimes like a hype topic, um, comparing the market potential to the actual size of the market currently, there, there's still a long way to go. And yeah, maybe asking the consulting side first as you are often researching, I guess, all these topics. Where do you see the um, yeah, tokenization of real, market, real world assets market? Is it more hype? Is it more a constant trend um, on the long term? I'm a bit topodizing my uh, keynote, which is following up now, because I'm taking out, uh, out, out the, the, the info. But I mean, if, if you look at it, we have under the Electronic Securities Act, I think we have 82 uh, issuances now. And it got a little bit easier to keep track since they started to use an Excel spreadsheet and, and not a picture anymore to count it up. Um, so this is a limited thing, I'd say. Um, still, uh, real assets are prominent now and everywhere, and I think that belongs also to, to another number, and that is, where is that driven from? Um, and when we, we did ask somewhat around 100 clients, not only from the banking space, but bigger, and um, 17% are driving it from the innovation department. And I think if you add it up, we come up to, to, to around 40%, which are driving it from either a technical department or the innovation department. And this is why this is interesting is, this is from the first side coming from the product side and not from the tech guys. So this is what excites me about it, but it might still be overhyped uh, in, in the sense that this is only one puzzle piece of, of a lot of product that needs to be out there, but definitely this could finally serve the purposes that we put out there, make financial services more tangible, easier, cheaper, and maybe more interesting, depending on what you, you all regard as, as assets. And Sabi, we also talked about it. Uh, it really depends. There's not even a clear definition on uh, what we all see when we talk about real-world assets. Um, this is also still open to discussion. Oh, maybe just to, to quickly come in here. Um, it, what, I, what I think is, number one, tokenization doesn't mean you make something liquid, right? And that's, that's always like, um, you know, sometimes you hear, it's like, oh, we're tokenizing, make assets liquid. There's just a lot to it. And, uh, and so where you see, again, I think where you come in and you think from technology perspective, so is there something behind it or is it just hype? No, I think there is a use case behind it. But it also, again, it depends on um, who you speak to, um, and it depends on, on the setup you're having. So just, uh, again, to you know, tokenize real estate or something, or a fund, even if, if that's not your core business, or if that's not, it, it just doesn't make sense. So you need to think about, okay, what's your core business? Where do you want to go to? Um, we have seen, I think I said it outside, a lot coming into the, uh, the stablecoin side as well. I mean, there's, there's projects out there as well, like RLN and others, that looking into that, like payments is a big part of the banking business, and why not start with that, especially for big global banks um, when it comes to cross-border, um, and that's, I think, where potentially the, the cost savings comes in as well, which brings me to the other point, is like the challenge is, you know, is it the money you can make or the, the efficiency you can gain? 
and would be good. It's probably a combination of both. Um, maybe I'll just add. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> with regards to the potential of uh, tokenization, I think that's definitely there because the market size is such massive. And um, not only, you know, tokenization not only, uh, you know, it brings efficiency, but also the a key element is digitization. So by digitization, you're actually improving accessibility massively. And we have seen this ourselves uh, when we um, rolled out our tokenized gold in HKMA for retail customers. So they can now buy LBMA gold using their mobile app in really small quantities as well. So, and you can imagine that um, real estate is probably another physical assets, uh, asset. You got, uh, you got um, of course, uh, fixed income. So these, these markets go into sort of uh, over uh, probably, probably multiple hundreds of trillions of dollars of market is there. Gold is probably uh, multiple trillions as well. So definitely, I mean, the market size is huge and there's so much opportunity to do there. Um. I think I'm going to be using two specific examples that we just discussed here, which are funds and real estate. I think that the drivers for these markets being the ones that are kind of like very hot right now uh, are essentially efficiency. Efficiency because everything that we've seen in the past with tokenization was fixed income. And th th these are like markets that are already efficient. We are seeing right now some players looking into equities, but in reality, equities is a very efficient market, right? So we really need to make sure that we're using this technology to improve things that today are not very efficient, right? And the second part is uh, market access, right? So why do we want to get into that? And uh, I think there was a presentation before talking about people want to kind of like diversify their portfolio, right? So how can we use technology to give them access to some asset classes that right now are very difficult to access, probably because you need a huge amount of money or just because there are so many intermediaries in the process that it just makes the process very cumbersome. So in my opinion, the reason why we're just seeing all these kind of like projects coming out and the pilots around the world is because they are essentially going from POC to MVP. They're just saying, I'm not testing technology, I'm making a real business use case, and this is where I can really make my first touch on the market, yeah. Hey, since I haven't commented, I feel under pressure to say something now, so I'm gonna say something. Um, so I think we're all in violent agreement, so I'll probably add my agreement to everything that's been said. Maybe just simplifying it for me, the way I think about tokenization, and it's not, quite intellectually correct, because there is some overlap, but I kind of think there's two reasons to do it. So one is about, uh, you know, I think Jürgen referenced it, about doing stuff that we do today, but do it cheaper and faster and more efficient. That by itself is a pretty good reason to do it, if you can achieve that aim. That's not always easy to achieve, because you've got legacy infrastructure, you've got other frictions, and often, actually linking to what Prashant was saying, sometimes standing up this infrastructure is actually more expensive than what you have today, and it will be for the short term until you can move enough volume onto it. So that's one part of it. The other piece to do tokenization is to create new products and services that in essence cannot be serviced or created today. So it's a slightly different lens. It's not about doing the same stuff. It's about doing something new, and it's developing new markets. So the decision that any institution has, which, which is looking at this topic, is sometimes, you know, which of those two routes do I want to go down? Um, and it might depend on the type of institution you are, which one of those paths have less friction. So I think that's one um, reasonably important point. The other point I completely agree with, uh, that tokenization doesn't necessarily in, in, equal increased liquidity. That's not necessarily the case. Um, but what it can do, potentially, if it's done correctly, is beyond allowing access to assets that some people don't have today and, and increasing that, which is, a, again, a good reason, it can actually serve as a very effective risk management tool because you're able to take a much more granular approach to how an asset might be structured or financed um, and take slices of that and sell and create markets for those. So, so that's probably the other side of it, which is using tokenization to actually manage risk. Thanks. Um for the for these insights, um, we have discussed it in the beginning a bit. There's no real definition of real world assets actually, 
or it's at least not 100% clear, there are different understanding from financial side, and speaking about tokenization of real world assets, how would you define real world assets actually, and what's then the advantage here, and uh, yeah. Well, I think, Prashant, you had a great definition the other day. I don't know if you wanted to... Uh, sh sure. So um, the, way, the way we look at it is basically, um, you know, not only the drivers, but also if you, if you can actually have a sort of a pattern to that. So, and the pattern we kind of follow is that, um, you know, you have assets which can be natively issued on chain. So dematerialized assets, which, uh, where you're not actually creating a digital twin on the chain, but actually the asset is born on the chain. So that's one pattern of looking at it. And bond is an example of that, fixed income is an example of that. And then the other category is basically tokenizing physical assets. And there's an important distinction here because in physical assets, you basically create a digital twin and then represent it digitally on, on the blockchain, right? And uh, you know, thinking about the drivers for that, of course, there is efficiency in bonds. You can do the settlement cycles quicker. Um, same is the case with the physical assets, such as gold. Um, uh, plus, there is accessibility, the point which I just mentioned about providing access to retail. But then there's also another consideration in sort of looking at these tokenization use cases. And what uh, Javier touched upon previously is, can you, do, can you do secondary trading and can you do repo on those? So that's also an important consideration. And uh, some of the operating models that are evolving, and certainly we have seen in HKMA bond issuance, we did uh, multi-currency bond issuance in HKMA, is that we've already been able to use those bond tokens for collateral, so Bank of East Asia used that. So that's also a consideration, you know, sort of uh, which, which tokenization brings along as well. So um, anything to add from your side? Or otherwise, um, yeah, I would continue to uh, the, one of the last questions. Um, what do you think are the most um, interesting asset classes then, um, or most promising um, real world assets to tokenize? As, um, for example, re real estate is the classic as example, but um, at least in Germany, there are lots of difficulties to actually um, be the owner of, of the asset then, directly of the real estate. Um, how do you see that maybe also, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can start that with a question to you, Savi. Uh, you, you mentioned the um, the risk uh, the risk reallocation um, or the more granular uh, slicing of of the risks and then being able to sell that to to well, free up more 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 risk um, um, capacity. Why do you think this has not has been focused on that much? Because uh, that puzzles me sometimes a little. I would see this as one of the first use cases. It's a good question. I think. Um, you know, something I was kind of alluding to earlier, inertia is, is a dangerous beast, right? So that's, that's always one, one thing. But quite frankly, I think everyone's mentioned it. Have you mentioned education? Education is a big challenge. The reality is, if you want to understand how this works, it requires some time and energy and effort. And most people in the organization that we work in have full-time jobs. And so dedicating time to understand the new technology uh, and how to harness it is actually not a straightforward thing. So I think that's where it starts. And that, by the way, that's part of our mandate internally. We're also trying to educate the organization on the opportunity. So that's one part of it. But also the reality is the market's not quite there. We're, we're a little bit of the chicken and egg, right? So we don't have enough issuances because we don't have enough issuances. There's not enough stuff to do. And because there's not enough stuff to do, people say, well, what's the point of doing an issuance? So that actually is also a little bit of the challenge we're facing with, with the whole you know, tokenized point, I mean, to your point, uh, Mark, around, you know, whether it's real estate or some of these other markets, the reality is you need to persuade someone to create an issuance. Of course, they'll look to see what level of liquidity is there in the market for this thing I'm about to create. You just need some folks to go first. And I think, you know, to take us right back to the start of the conversation, I think the reason for optimism is we're starting to see that. We're starting to see enough projects you know, whether it's, you know, bonds being pushed out there now in tokenized form or gold, you know, Sean's talking about that, or even real estate, we're starting to see that happen. And the hope and expectation is that creates that 
positive flywheel, so we get more and more issuance, more and more trading, we get the collateral management, we get the repo pieces that Javier was talking about as well. I think that's, that's hopefully where we end up. I know you just said, I'm, I'm actually curious to see what's going to happen in the US, um, because I still remember 2021 when the hype was there, a lot of was driven out of the US. You see the ETP issuance with Bitcoin ETPs, uh, which again has created a whole new hype um, in Europe. It's been here for four or five years now, but because it's the US, there's another drive. So if we see more happening there, I think it's still a big driver as well, and it will flow over um, um, to us here as well with potentially new projects. So, so very curious to see what's happening. Thanks. Yeah, I think that was a nice last statement uh, to this very optimistic uh, panel here. Um, I'm looking forward to see um, what all the institutions are launching soon. And I'm now um, yeah, looking forward that there's some traction now in, and we will see a lot of projects.